in the uh, it um, we wind up having clean water and the antibodies that were in the dirty water we stop ingesting and being exposed to and so by the the, the 30s and the 40s um, nobody had the immunity to polio mm -hmm. really so typhoid well, the same away. thing polio came <laughs> It's, it was much wider than that. You know, here in this country, they want to keep little little babies absolutely clean. If they get around and they crawl around the dirt and they eat the dirt, I mean, that's no-no. But you go okay. to developing countries and the kids there don't get diseases because they get all this stuff, you know, from the moment they're when they're crawling around on the dirt. No, they back the off from that view. Pardon? Well, I, I can remember eating some dirt myself when I was a kid, so I think I got my share. Did your father ever tell you, put that down, that's not shock, that's an old dog through? Dad wasn't there. <laughs> Dad wasn't there. <laughs> it's like the time I was out. I was out uh, playing in the mud puddles, and all I had on was my socks. Everything <laughs> else was off, but I was in that mud puddle. <laughs> well, 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 when you think about how a lot of kids, you know, they went to the old swimming hole, you know, and now, you know, uh, don't go there. There's these critters, there's bugs, there's the, uh, you know, those... Uh, you know, little bears that you can't kill except in a gun, you know, and all that. And so Plus, the water is green. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to be yeah, careful because there's a lot of mining that have been done around here in California anyway. And so then yeah. you've got, you know, all kinds of, you know, creepy stuff that could be in there. Right. Right included. Yeah, chemicals are not, not, uh, not, uh, you know the the animal. You know the germs. Now you now like. you've got the brain eating amoebas too. Yeah, yeah there you go. The, 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 the warmer water. Yeah, <laughs> hold your nose. Yep. At the far end of Lake Kachuma is a mercury mine, an old mercury mine. I've been there. Up by Gibraltar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots of mercury. And 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 that's the where Santa Barbara gets their water from. Yes. Well, but not, <laughs> not either. Comes down not entirely. Their water from. <laughs> But, but that's why they don't try to dredge Kachuma ever, because they're afraid they'll dig up a bunch of old sediments. Stuff yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. In Simi Valley, we had the uh, Santa Susana uh, labs where they had the, uh, the meltdown in 1959. Or was it oh, yeah, they really hushed that up. And, and, uh, and dumping a whole bunch of stuff at Rocketdyne, you know, on other things. So. So can I ask, uh, does, does anyone have a topic that they want to present this evening and have something you want to bring up? Well, I could be real brief on one thing. Someone asked about off-axis guiding last time, and I said I'd show my off-axis guiding. <laughs> so that sound, sounds good. I have two, two different ways that I do it. One is um, this thing, which is <clears throat> this goes... This goes in the eyepiece tube. This is the guide scope up here. This is a starfish from Fish Camp Engineering in um, wherever that is up near Santa Maria. Anyway, and a friend of mine operates that and a club member, Bob Petek. So he used to make these and he still has the housing. He makes, now he makes uh, cameras using this housing for the uh, Air Force. Um, the work place I consulted with, we made, uh, we, we designed and built cameras using this. This is where my DSLR mm -hmm. sits on there. And so it hangs out there. And if you look inside. Oh, there's a prism. Yeah, you can see the pickoff prism up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I allow for this extra <clears throat> um, space that you need, you know, the extra rear um, focal clearance, uh, back focal, back focus. And then the other thing that I have, oops, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hear you, but yeah. No, no video.
you still hear me? Yeah, yep. just can't see you. <laughs> Looks like my camera's gone off. Uh oh. <clears throat> it's just off axis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does the off-axis guider give you any artifacts in the pictures? It's a little light, but not that much. I mean, it's minuscule. Okay, because it's out of the focus. It just drops some light. <clears throat> what did you get, Jerry? I had a, I used off-axis guidance for a while, but gave up on it. I just want to ask Jerry about that when he gets back here. Uh, the problem I had was such a small field of view and finding a star. Sorry so, about that. Okay. Yeah, I had a question about off-axis guiding. I yep. used that for a while, but gave up on it because it was so hard to find a guide star in a relatively narrow field. And uh, so I, I eventually, I just quit trying. I quit using that method. Yeah. Okay. Well, I also have um, two QSI cameras. And they have the off-axis prism built in. And this is the tightest um, that I have to get close to the telescope. So it can't see good. anything. That's because it's all black and blue. So there you're looking down. Oh yeah. wow, that's quite a bit more of a prism. Yeah, it's it's a it's but it's it's a smaller camera back there than. Oh the, yeah, so you don't need to worry about it. Yeah, and then this is um, one. I think it's a Lodestar guide camera. It's on oh. here with a special um, convenient oh. mounting for focusing it, so it's not such a pain in the butt. So uh, you raise a, a good point, and that is finding a guide star. Uh, you need a fairly large telescope. It it makes it easier when you're working on galaxies, which is one of my favorite topics, and and you're not in the star-rich Milky Way, so you're looking out into the Virgo cluster. Um, one of the, there are a couple that I found quite challenging to find a suitable guide star, and because I like my guide, uh, the, the guide camera, to take a picture every one second. Um, I can get up to three or even five seconds, but uh, then it gets problematic for wind or anything like that because it, it may move before it gets the next correction. But um, that's where I use a rotator on my camera because you can, um, on a star chart, that I have a program, I forget the name of it, but it lets you put your camera and your telescope, all the, all the properties of it in, and it'll show you what the region of that, around that object looks like. And then you can mm -hmm. identify the stars you want and then you rotate the camera around until the pickoff yeah. prism is oriented so that it gets you in a region where there's a star. And I've never had that uh, go wrong. Sometimes it is a little challenging to get it hooked up right, but uh, it's never been a problem. And I found that flexure that is non-round stars has virtually disappeared with that, especially with the larger telescopes, the longer ones that I have. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's yeah. that. Yeah, so let me... Yeah. Um... Let me show you my own uh, configuration. Can you guys all see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is because I was the one asking the question, right? So yeah. what you see here, this this black tube is the, the coma corrector. And then here um, is the off-axis guider. And on top is the AC120 mini. Um, and then this is the camera. So this mm -hmm. is 2600, that big red cylinder. And there's a rope to make sure that it doesn't fall off the focuser. I wrap that around the focuser. So anyway, yeah. So um, there's a focuser on this uh, off-axis guide. There's the blue ring. If you can see it, you can just turn it. It's a helical focuser, and that actually fixed one of my problems because I what my problem was part of my problems was that the stars were not straight. I mean, they were not round. They were like a straight line. And uh, but as as I wait a minute, I have, I have a it, question. It became a point. And so, so that fixed one thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the stars are a straight line. You mean the star in the image is a straight line or is the star? No, the it, it, was, it, it was like an, an almost rectangular image. It was probably elliptical or something like that, but it was, it was strange. And, and um, yeah, I don't know how it got shaped like that. 
must be because of the prism or something like that. Well, could your could your pixels be not square? Could they be elongated? Well, um, the well, no, the pixels are just uh, regular pixels. They're not uh, rectangular well, pixels. Some are some are rectangular. No, oh, okay. Well, these are not. Okay, um, good. No, no, but uh, also focusing fixed it somehow so that good. I mean, I, that would not. I don't know how that would relate to rectangular pixels, but whatever. So it, it may be an optical effect because you're working with a pick-off prism that may introduce some diffraction. Well, and then the other thing too is you're at the edge of the field. So you're going to get whatever chroma distortion you have there at the edge of the field. So I would think that that would fall in place with, with your pick-off. So you got a coma corrector. And right. you're going to get comb, you're still going to get coma distortion. You know that already. So you're still going to have some coma distortion. So your pick off your prism is right there where that coma distortion is yeah. maybe the greatest. I have found that the, the, the distortion of the guide star is irrelevant because no matter how bad it is, I have some with very bad coma and sometimes I correct coma. Yeah. To the perfect point, but it doesn't matter. Whatever's there. You, the software will find it finds um, a centroid yeah right, exactly and that's what yeah. you track on and it's very good about that what i use um what is a phd guiding yeah that's what yeah. i do well yeah. aside from that the the illumination of the star gets a lot better when it's focused so that, that was one of my problems i had fixed it uh, focused it once before and i thought it was good but it was not good enough so that made a big difference and yes, I, I still have, unfortunately, I cannot turn this, this guy around easily. So I'd have to really uh, loosen the focuser and turn it around and refocus again. So um, that's not great. So yeah. Um, and I would like to do it, of course, from my desk, but I, you can't do it. If, even if you have to rotate something, you have to be out there. But um, yeah, I guess I'll just have to turn it around and then refocus again. And with an, auto, an autofocuser, it's not too bad. But I've seen that with some targets you, you you can find a guide star with other targets you can't. I think I think I was trying M51 last time and I could not find a guide star and had to move it way around before I found something. Anyway, yeah, I had real trouble with M51 with that uh, now does, kind of setup. Is there a helical mm -hmm. focuser on the uh, off axis yes. guide? So you yeah. got a helical focus. Okay. Yes, this little yeah. blue thing here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I replaced the helical focuser with um, a spring-loaded gizmo oh. that has one screw up above it. And if I turn that screw, then the, the um, guide camera moves up and down without anything having to rotate or anything. Hmm. So these are made and sold by a guy hmm. in um, uh, north of Highway 10 between Phoenix and the California border. Okay. I forget the name <laughs> of the town. <laughs> But if you look around on the internet, you can find these things. They're made specifically for QSI cameras, but I'm sure he could make one or you could adapt it to anything. It's, it's really very handy. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, thanks for that. And thank you. So Hank, how's your new camera working out? I haven't been here for a couple of weeks to um, find out. It's, it's working fine, actually. So um, yeah, I had one session where I had like a one arc second uh, RMS. And that does not relate to the camera, but it makes for a nice uh, sharp image. <laughs> so um, although I have to say it has been windy and that's part of the reason why um, the RMS is not all that great. You can tell, you know, you, <laughs> sometimes it's almost impossible to focus. It, it, it remains blurry, and it's just a matter of if, if there's too much wind, uh, you can't do much. Um, so my, my main problem was, was actually with a 2600 was uh, how to use it for plate solving. And that has been resolved to some extent. So it turns out the binning has an effect. So um, sometimes if I bin it four times, it works. And sometimes I have to bin it uh, one or two by two. Um, and that, that that is weird. I, I just don't quite get it. So I, I, I have to look at the interface. I don't know exactly, because um, you know I have no problems plate solving with my cheap SSAG auto guider. That's a simple QH by five. It's an ugly image, but it works great. <laughs> no problem. It's, uh, it resolves it all the time. And now with my fancy 2600, it, it's suddenly a problem. So I don't know if it's the different field of view or maybe does the coma corrector perhaps a, a, transform the image that, that the plate solver gets confused. 
I don't know. So, but I'm half the time I'm lucky these times, and sometimes you have to try again, and it works. I also read online that sometimes you have to. So, so some plate solvers like Astap, they like to know where they have to start. So if you first sink from a known position, like say you're in the near Polaris and just sink on that one, and then slew slew elsewhere, and then it will have a find have an easier time finding uh, finding the where it is. Anyway, so that. Um, it's mostly solved, but um, it's still not working perfectly. It's not 100% reliable. So if any of you have uh, ideas on how to improve that, that would be welcome. I, I do know that uh, there's a difference in, in plate solvers because the one that came with the side tech, um, that always gets a solution no matter what. Whereas uh, AstroArt, uh, I'm still having issues uh, getting it to find where where it's at. Okay. Yeah. So I I think it's the programmers what algorithms they're using. Yeah, I, I was hoping it was not because uh, so I, I'm I'm just hoping that there are only a limited number of plate solvers and that they are being used by all these packages like. Uh, uh, astrometry.net is used by AstroTotia, I believe, and it's also used by ECOS, and ECOS also supports ASTAP, and ASTAP is supported by a bunch of um, products. So I would rather not have to buy a different interface, user interface, to, to have access to a different... Yeah, I don't know what Dave Rowe used uh, for his, but it, it seems to work very well. He wrote it himself. Yeah. yeah. I, I use astrometry.net. You know, I just submit the, the images myself when I'm doing the asteroid occultations to make sure I'm on the right field. And I know that if, if I take a long exposure and there are too many stars, sometimes it just sticks and won't get an answer. But if I uh, cut down the integration and have fewer stars, sometimes it does a much better job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for, for a while I was being lucky with just uh, using four by four binning and then uh, a high gain that, that turns out. So yeah, if you have a lot of, and, and that's just the other way around, but it, it made for an ugly image that was more like the one that I see with my SSAG. <laughs> anyway, it seems to be working off and on and in time I'll figure it out. Well, I've been making some progress with the, the next dome interface. Um, I finally got it to communicate properly uh, with SciTech, the, the, the ASCOM hub, and uh, the NextDome software. And it's more or less pointing in the general direction of the uh, telescope. Now I have to do fine tuning. But uh, you have to watch out for putting proper values in the, uh, in the solver that goes from one coordinate system to another, or else it just, for me, it just didn't work at all. And and now it's it's working. So uh, I'm getting very close to being able to uh, have the dome slave to the, uh, the telescope. It's a little off now. Sometimes the slits like maybe a quarter into the field of view of the uh, telescope now. So it's a and lot so better. What, what are you using for that? Well, the next dome has their own oh. rotator. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and it yeah. goes through the hub. And I've been learning a whole lot uh, along the way. As a matter of fact, uh, in part of my troubleshooting, I wound up using my Raspberry Pi to control the telescope and the, and the dome and all that wirelessly. And so, I, in a way, it was, it's been a real pain. But in another way, it's been a really good learning experience. So now using DLC, um, once I get everything going, I could uh, control everything uh, remotely, which is a, a good thing on a cold, windy day in a cramped, uh, in a cramped <laughs> dome. <laughs> and, and good for you guys. Uh, I forget, what is it? Uh, Dick, uh, are, are you the one that's getting the 10-foot dome instead of the... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, Bob, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, we're getting Bob, that, yeah. Yeah, That's okay. been ordered, and it's uh, we're expecting to be here in the middle of August. Wow! Getting it, we're getting it all. I'm getting ready to 
working with guys to get it assembled and yeah. get it going. Yeah. Now, now, if, now, if you don't need to, to automate the whole thing, I've, I've come up with another technique as a fallback plan B in case I couldn't get this to work at all. At all electronics for five bucks, they've got these wonderful crosshair lasers. And so um, you only need two in order to define a square on the dome so you can aim them and then put a shutter over the areas where um, uh, you don't want any light to show so that if the dome slit gets in the way, it'll light up the dome on the inside and you go up, oh, time to move. Time to move. <laughs> I got an idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna throw this one out here and you guys can poke holes at it. But let's say you've got a guide scope on top of your <coughs> regular scope, they're piggybacked to one another and you're shooting east of the meridian. Now, that guide scope is going to lead the primary scope a bit, okay? As long as you're shooting east of the meridian, it's going to be in front of it. Now, you might choose a guide star that might be below, but the thing is, is you're right there next to the dome. There isn't going to be much enough of an angle there, I would think, that that scope would be able to be out of the way enough. So what my point is, is that you could look at the star, the guide star that you got, and look at the intensity of that star in PhD. And if it drops off, you'll know that the dome is starting to impinge on your guide scope. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to move that dome over a little bit as a result of that. That's what I'm gonna try. I, you know, you guys can poke holes in it if you want, but I'm gonna be always shooting east of the meridian. So I'm gonna try and go for it mm -hmm. and, uh, and see how it's gonna go. For me, so, if the guide if the guide star fades, it means the fog's coming in. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that That's too. True. That's true. Yeah, but well, then you can just hang it up. <laughs> Call it a yeah. night. You know, I've got a C14 sitting out in my shop right now with nothing to mount it on, nor observatory to put it in. So that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> I'm like a, I'm like a heroin yeah. addict without you know without a stick. <laughs> well, you have incentive, Dick. Yeah, you have right. Incentive to get something going here. Yeah. <laughs> Doggone. You know, we, we haven't heard from Tim for a while with how his scope is going. Um, but I sent him a Ronky gram to show kind of what my scope looked like. Tom Whittemore used to say, "You have you have pathological defects." <laughs> and I said, when you see this on your when you see this on your Ronky gram, you know that you've got problems. So, uh, Tom, is it okay if I share? He's not here, I don't think. Uh, oh, you, he left the Tom. No, I mean Tom Totten. Oh, is it Tom. Okay screen. Yeah, Tom's here. He was here. He's it, there. He's there. Is it there okay? He is. Okay screen. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. Looks like a curved edge to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, joke over. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Dick, you were talking about moving the dome. Don't you have a motorized uh, dome? Or well, that's what I'm. No, I'm going to try without it. The oh, dome okay. itself is eight feet. The 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 perimeter of the stationary part is 10, 10 feet six inches, uh -huh. and it's a four foot. It comes up. It's four foot high, and then it goes up another two feet. So the actual horizon is six feet. Okay. That I've got right there. So uh -huh. I'm just going to move it by hand. I heard that these things are really easy to move. Okay, the next domes, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, this yeah. is not a next dome. This is a uh, explorer dome or polydome. Oh, oh. I think it's oh, okay. what they call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we looked at the polydome. I looked at those. Yeah. But um, no, I'm, we're getting a motorized um, uh, uh, a motor to turn the, the dome around in ours, but not for the shutter. That's going to be manual. If we need eventually to get a motor to raise the shutter, we can add that later. But right I'm now, that's manually. We'll do I'm that still trying later. to get that working on mine. Shutter right. control is expensive. It's your dome. It's your dome. 
King was still open doors. Bruce, you sound like an electronic yodel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> what country too was that? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I was thinking of Hawkins, but I, you know, I guess that's kind of rude, William. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if it, the control has to be so expensive. I mean, you have to have a motor, but a, a program like ECOS will control your entire observatory, you know, with, with shutter and, and, and motor and everything. I mean, that's pretty cool. Way to go. It's, yeah. it's how you drive it, though. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's it right there. That's it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I can't so, wait till it gets here. I ordered it in January 22nd and we're still not here yet. So uh, I just, you know, I, I keep waiting and waiting. I, I've asked these guys about it. And they're still, you know, we're still working on it. You don't but have any I, delivery date? I haven't got a delivery date yet. Okay. No. Uh, so, but uh, it's 27 inches on the shutter width, which you know, so I'm getting that's a four. I've got the C14 plus I have the MP127 IS will be on top of that, and then there's going to be whatever else is in between. So I'm getting out to the max on that guy. I'm thinking this technique might work pretty well for me, uh, with just you know, just using that as that thing dims mm -hmm. down, I'll just move it over a little bit. The so only thing is, you could move it over too much. And then you might, you know, impinge on the C14. So on the um, on the on the pro dome that we're getting, it has a 36 inch wide opening. That's dome. nice. That'll help and, a lot. And uh, and then the door, uh, the when you put the the observatory opening over the door, then the door opens up so that then you can walk in standing up. That's so, so you do not have to duck down. Yeah, and that, uh, that, that was so important for people here who, who are in walkers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, yeah, the pro dome, I don't know, has pictures of it. Uh, it's explored on them. It's uh, with the 10 inch. I don't know if you can pull up the 10 inch, Tom, but uh, uh, look at the pro dome, it'll show you. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're we're getting one. We're, we're getting two walls. We're getting if you if you go the upper. Uh, okay. That that's so the Trojan. Yeah. Oh. No, that's phony. I've talked with him. Oh, oh, that. that's a phony it's, thing. Can yeah. I be pulling plugs here at home? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here it is the the second one down. Is, yeah, the second one down. That's how what ours will look like. Oh, that's, uh -huh. yeah, 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 that's what it'll look like. We'll have a total of two walls and then the top wall that the dome sits on. Yeah. So that's the way it'll look. Hmm. That's the shape of it. Yeah. And then you could just get uh, more and more wall blocks to go up higher. If you right, want to right. If you want, you can build up much higher if you wish, uh -huh. but it's cost. I mean, every one of them, oh, costs yeah, about yeah. 1500 bucks. Oh boy, yeah. So, so it's not cheap to build no. it up and it's not really necessary uh, to have it really high uh, because inside you have plenty of headroom. Mm -hmm. I think I think the top of the dome is over eight feet in this particular configuration. With yeah. your two two levels down below, okay. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it's, it's brilliant white, so it will reflect the sun. And the one we're getting is a brilliant, brilliant white. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's a description. So it all comes, it all comes uh, knocked down in a huge box. And so I got to get with our head guy here at Westminster, who's in charge of, of, of the all the structural stuff here at the at our, on our campus, and we're going to be working together on this. But he, fortunately, he's very interested in astronomy. So uh, when I first talked with him, he, uh, he said, I want to get a telescope. And so he's very interested in this. 
So that'll be fun. I think it'd be fun working with him on this. Now, does that dome, are you going to need to have a crane to set that thing or how? how no, it comes, it comes in, in broken down fiberglass. So okay. each section, you have to. So you build it in situ, I guess is what the deal is. That's right. You build it in okay. situ. And, and uh, the, the, the walls uh, are come in sections. It all comes in sections. And we're having them pre drilled at the factory. So we oh. don't have to line everything up. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they, for extra amount, for about 600 bucks more, they, they'll pre drill it for you. So then uh, we just have to take uh, the bolts that apply and so on and, and you know, assemble really? it, put it together. And then um, uh, it's done, but it's done on site. That's right. But I guess the box that comes in is, is really. Uh, intimidating and they write a whole separate thing is it's called the box that consumed the garage and <laughs> they said don't be surprised when this thing comes it's huge it comes on a truck a flatbed truck or something and uh so but but the individual pieces are not that heavy the whole thing after it's assembled only weighs 350 pounds oh, oh wow. nothing yeah. wow that's yeah. very light yeah. Huh. Now, now the motor um, does the motor is the motor in the dome rotational part or is it in the stationary part? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure precisely how that's installed. I haven't uh, sat down and read all the directions on that yet. Because that's but, one of the things I've seen is these guys in you know, there. They, they put the, the Explorer Dome, the, the stuff that I've seen with what they've got in their control system is they've got all the stuff and then motor and everything is in the dome. And I'm just thinking, geez, you get all this weight up there. It seems like it would be better if at least rotational control was in the stationary portion. So you didn't have to try and communicate it across uh, a yeah. rotational portion. Uh, now, but the shorter the shutter control, you're going to have to do it in, in the yeah. Portion, but at least the dome control, the, the rotational control, you shouldn't have to. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's that's a good question, Dick. And I, I don't know how to answer it at this point because uh, I haven't I haven't read the directions that far down. I've just gone through stuff to, to assemble the base and the dome. Yeah. And, uh, so I mean, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm just thinking about rolling my own thing you know with various bits and pieces and uh to try to put a system together uh and, and maybe try to get something that's ASCOM or you know like Hank has got with the Zcos. uh that's kind of the direction I'm thinking it if I go that direction yeah yeah well you can you can uh totally remote this observatory they have a whole uh, they have the equipment and connections to make it totally remote, but we're not. I'm not interested in spending the money to do that. It's not necessary for what we what we're doing. Uh, because this, is, wherever I am, I'm only within a few minutes of the observatory. Whether I'm inside lecturing or talking to the residents in a nearby room, or I'm, I'm only a few minutes away. So it. If something goes wrong, you know, I can get out and you know, correct it. But um, yeah, so we're, and we're having to watch our expenses because 20% um, of this is being paid for by Westminster. 80% uh, is being funded by residents. So this is a really uh, resident, primarily a resident undertaking, which, which is good. I mean, I think people have some skin in the game, and they're going to probably really appreciate more what we've got. And it's going to be a good setup. I'm very excited about it. I think combined with the 11-inch edge and the video cameras, the, the iTech cameras I have and all that, it's, we're going to have, we're going to be able to do some good stuff with it. In spite of the light producing here. But we don't have fog, okay? We don't have fog. <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> we'll give you some of ours. How about that? <laughs> no, you can keep it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<laughs> you guys get yeah. monsoons. <laughs> now yeah, down, down here, this picture that he's showing um, on the second row down of pictures at the far right. Uh, yeah, there. See the door opens there, and that's where you can enter in. Uh, oh yeah, that's where you can you can enter in standing up, and that is wide enough to get walkers through. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we got a lot of people here in walkers. The wheelchairs, of course, they're going to have to watch it on TV in the uh, other room where we're going <clears> to <throat> broadcast the image into a television in there. <coughs> Yeah, so those are all, yeah, a bunch of pictures of it, <laughs> different configurations. Is anybody going to be looking at the uh, lunar eclipse? You're going to be. Okay, my, my yeah. Yeah, I've got my uh, Arduino. I'm testing it now. Uh, ah. for <laughs> in case I fall asleep. <laughs> 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 As Bruce pointed, pointed, Bruce pointed out that it's going to be pretty low to the horizon. It's like oh. maybe less than 20 degrees up, 15. Well, I'm probably rest at 10. You have a Tom, you have an image of a observatory program that shows the eclipse at the at the peak from uh, yesterday's um, what well, podcast. Let's see if I can find that. Yeah, for me, it's it's at 19 degrees at 4 a.m. and down to 14 degrees by 4:30. Mm. <laughs> and maximum 260 degrees, so in the southwest. Come here. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hey, Tim. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I'm tr trying to figure out, Tom, how I can send you these attachments. I, it, my stupid iPad keeps sending it to Gmail, which I don't have on my ancient uh, uh, computer. But I'll I'll get it done. I worked on my scope today, but I don't want to send images and uh, uh, kind of in light of the 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 uh, mail the email I just got before the meeting. So uh, it would just be boring for everybody. No, I, I don't think it's boring. Well, I sent an, I sent a, a, a mail, an email to, I don't know who that was to, but I sent it a reply to everyone regarding hmm. what, was, what was sent and giving everybody an idea of where this workshop came from. And uh, a, a couple of thoughts, I, I, I can't stay tonight, but a couple of thoughts came to me. Uh, <laughs> since i wrote that and that that oh, the workshop originally yeah can you go back uh wide view again and you see the legend in the upper left corner the white legend that'll tell you the date and the time so this is at 4 14 in the morning which i i believe is supposed to be the peak um eclipse time Okay, so that's why you were saying if I'm up then, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna be. <laughs> but tell you that much right now. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a house in the way. I think I've got a lot of things in the way. What, what constellation is the moon in? Scorpius. Uh, Oh yeah. Well, we, we I can see Antares there. Yeah. Tim four. Yeah. Yeah. This is the site in the southwest, right? So yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah so we, we I could see it from our observatory site, but I don't want to. It's just I've seen a lot of eclipses, and this is not a total eclipse. So I'm just not highly motivated to get up yeah. that early in the morning. No, not me. To go look. <laughs> <coughs> Wait for the next one. I had a problem with the NP127 IS in that I couldn't figure out how to put a filter, a regular size two inch filter in it. And so I started looking around and uh, I saw, 
I can figure out where it is right now. Let me see if I can get over there right now. There it is right there. Okay, so over here. That's the guy you need right there. So when you get the Canon EOS adapter, the, the, there's a threaded portion on the inside of this guy right here. And I thought, well, I can just thread in my little filter in there. And no, you cannot. You got to use this little guy right here. I think it's the deal that you got to use to adapt it up. So that's where I'm at right there on that guy right there. Hmm. So uh, let's see here. The other thing I did is um, I went into, let's see if I can see share screen here. And we'll go here. Share that right there. What I did was I had a problem with, I'll take the mask off this guy right here, right now here. Got the mask on there right now, remove that mask. This is basically the constellation or the, the 24 millimeter shot that I got. And so what I did was I went back and I basically, with masking, you can still see a little bit of light pollution over here, but boy, I got guys, I mean, it was like halfway across this thing with light pollution. Mm -hmm. And the way that I did this is by using a mask. I put the mask over this thing and I thought, okay, you don't really have any large structure here. So normally what I would do, if let's say I had a nebula or something like that, I would apply the mask and I would mask out the stars and then I would do a curse transformation and bring out the nebula. And then I would reverse the, the mask and bring out the stars the way that I wanted to. In this particular case, there's no large scale structure. So in fact, what I did I applied the mask and then I just brought the star, I brought the sky uh, background down uh, over what it had already been stretched to and, uh, and then reversed it and then I could bring the stars out. I don't like this particular setup right now. I'm gonna go back and redo it a little bit, but you can kind of see like, let's say for example, that's the tail of Leo right there. That's part of the question mark. And, extends over here and I think Rigel might be one of these stars over there but anyway it's coming along is what I'm saying is is that with masking I can fix this problem here uh, the star colors are there and everything like that it's just that I don't like this particular rendition because I think I'm going to do some different things with the masking on this when I did the masking on this I did I did it in two stages and I want to do it in one stage when I mask, I use something called a multi-scale linear transform. And basically what this thing does is it's a size discriminator. And I, I, I had a lot of trouble trying to figure out how to mask stars appropriately using the techniques that uh, are built into the environment and fix site is not good enough. But this tool here, I found that with eight levels of size, you can pretty much discriminate between any star sizes that you want to use in an image. And what I did is I says, okay, let's break this up into small stars, medium sized stars and large stars. And we'll put them in these different bins depending on if I've got an, normally you only have stars that are like, let's say maybe small stars versus medium stars. And when I say small versus large, I'm talking about point spread. Okay. So, uh, and so what this does is it discriminates between these different sizes. So I have a mask that I make up that's made up of one and two layer. These are the smallest layers. So the smaller the number, the, the smaller the size. In the second level, second layer level, I, I up this bias term right here to about 0.3. And what that does is it makes the smallest stars in the image appear. Smallest things you could possibly get in that image will appear when that happens. And that's one size discrimination. Then there's a three to five, that's your middle layer. And then there's six to eight, that's your large layer. 
So when I do the constellation mask, I did that as a separate step. And what I'm going to do is combine them all into one mask. And I think that I'll get better results. But this is what happens. And then what you do is you use a mathematical expression. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Pixel math. No, it's not in there. But basically what you do is you use a max function. And what this does is it takes the maximum of any argument that I put in here. Okay, so if I take this, I, there's one mask right there. There's your one to two mask, and then there's your three to five mask. So you put those two masks in there. So what that does is it chooses, it chooses the maximum of any of those two masks that puts us in there. And then you get a combined mask, which is combining of those two size discriminations. By the time you do that, you get a very, very good masking of the image. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, if we apply the mask, that's the combined mask right there. I'll do that. Now you notice that now everything is red. So that mask has been applied. It's also brown over here. So I'll invert that mask and then we can see how good the masking is. Every single star is covered. You can't do this, in my opinion, there's no other way to do this and get this kind of masking. So this gives me control over the stars and it gives me control over the sky. That's why, mm -hmm. why, why I do it this way. And in this particular case, I can get rid of the light pollution. Uh, it's such a wide angle and the structure is so small, we're talking about galaxies, that it doesn't matter. Uh, if it were the Milky Way, yeah, you might not be able to get away with the technique. Is this so a that's my little site? dog. Sorry? Is this part of PixInsight? Is this what This is this? all PixInsight that I'm showing you right in here. Yeah, that's very interesting, yeah. but I'm getting tired. I'm going to have to leave. Okay, Jerry. Good night. Good, Good luck with you your health. Thanks. Okay. Hope you feel yeah. better, Jerry. I'm gonna have to go Great. too, Jerry. I'm I'm gonna have to go pretty soon. I'm I'm gonna uh, I, I sent you an email, Tom. I've got a couple images to show uh, from uh, Mercury and and all that uh, that I managed to to take. Um, <clears throat> Did you get the sodium tail? Yeah, I didn't get any. You know what? This is wide field. It's uh, I well, let let me let me just uh, do uh, <coughs> a second here. I can't see. Tim, I'm not seeing your images yet. Yeah, I'm I'm working on it right now. Yeah. Hey, Dick, I still have some questions about the masks, but. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So I, I've tried masking uh, in, in GIMP. And um, what I often see is that if I want to highlight the stars that way, um, so that then because you cannot get a very super sharp, at least in GIMP, we cannot, um, surrounding of a star. And uh, if you bring them back in, then sometimes that, that what's around it gets more amplification than it should. And they, they, oh, so ringing stars basically that's the term I'm, yeah i'm, I'm how, just, there's some how steps does, how missing does, yeah how, how does uh pix inside deal with that well what you're I, talking it's, about the the mask, it's one it. thing but then you have to bring it back in and then you might get ringing stars so i'm just curious well yeah well the ringing the ringing that you're referring to that i normally see that on the deconvolution step uh that causes ringing but uh, when I do the masking, it could probably do that if the masking wasn't done quite right, because you're going to get some dis edge dislocation effects from bright to, uh, to dark. But what I'm doing with those masks, when I do those transforms, the next step is uh, turn it to grayscale because it's color, okay? Because you're only going to operate on the luminance channel. Then, and then after that, I binarize it. So it's either on or it's off. There's none of this, you know, no, no more grayscale. So, and then I just sit there and I look at, I take a, a preview, a small section of the image, and I look at that and I go, okay, that's about right. 
there are certain numbers that come up usually all the time. So, and then after that, to keep the ringing from occurring, you have to convolute it. So you mm -hmm. smooth, you're smoothing, the, you smooth it out just enough so that you don't get, you don't get that induced ringing in there quite so much. Right. Uh, for the small size stars, you don't do as much convolution. For the lot, for if you do the medium size, you convolute a little bit more. For the large stars, you convolute even more than that. See, that allows you by doing those size bends, you're able to convolute a class, a classification. If you try to convolute over an entire range of sizes, it's not going to work. You've got to have a convolution that fits that class of size. Okay. I find it difficult because oftentimes the color of the stars is actually on the outside of the star. So the center is really bright. Yeah, you, and you have, you're you talking keep, about. You want to keep the color, right? So that's mostly on the outside. So. If you start masking it, that's where the mask actually operates. So, but I are you talking about halos, or are you talking about the actual star image itself? See, because you got the halo of the star is going to be in the mask. It's going to no, be in not, that mask. No, I'm not talking about halos. Uh, okay. Maybe I can find an image somewhere as, as, a, as an example. But oftentimes, you know, the star, the way the stars look um, after stacking then they're very bright in the center and the, the brightness goes down on the sides. And that's where the color often shows up. So anyway, that, that's- Oh, hmm. Besides, saturating the- uh, Oh, you're motion. saying you're getting a ringing effect there. Yeah. No, but no, sometimes the, the mask removes that outside rim that has the color and then your stars end up being black and white, which is ugly. So, well, yeah, and you can get raccoon stars with my technique. That's why you have to go back and invert yeah. the mask and bring the stars up just a little yeah. bit of, you know. So, so what I've been doing, it, it, instead of masking, I've been using uh, Starnet++, and it's probably a plugin for PixInsight as well, but that's uh, used by several people. It's just something that you can run from the command line. It removes the, um, uh, the stars completely from your image. It wow. separates them. So you can, you can then operate on your cleaned up uh, nebulae or whatever separately. And then later on, you just bring the stars back in and just, just crank it up because the nebulosity is much weaker, right? So it's just a matter of cranking up the gain a little bit as much as you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, that, that, that works for me best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I, ask a question? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. What does ringing mean in your astrophotography? What does that mean? Well, there's something called ringing which refers to an effect called the Gibbs effect. And the Gibbs effect has to do when you have a, a intensity dislocation, shall we call it. And that's something like where you have a star or the point spread of a star versus the black scars, the background of the star. Okay, this the sky background. So that dislocation, here's light, now you have dark. And so what happens is a result of that is that you, that transition is that it can cause ringing around the stars. Now, literally what that, that, or what that visually looks like could be like a little ring around, you'll have the star and then you'll have a ring around the star. That's ringing. Uh, when you do deconvolution, deconvolution is the process that, uh, that reverses some of the atmospheric effects, okay? And the net result of deconvolution is, you hope, smaller star images. When you reduce those star images, you have to use a certain amount of what they call de-ringing to do that. Because what are you going to replace? If you're going to take a star and you're going to shrink it down in size, what are you going to replace that with? That, that the, what you shrunk and that, the, the part that you shrunk and down, you're gonna have to replace it with something. And so what you have to do is you have to tweak these little settings. There's one called global dark and there's one called global light. Global dark is the one I always use. And you have to tweak that thing with a fine tooth comb. I mean, I'm talking about 0. 0.0015 type stuff, you know? I mean, it's down to that, not massive. And, you know, so it becomes, a, it, it becomes one of those things that's ringing. That's the ringing effect right there. Yeah, let me let me try to describe it in a different way. So what the way I do it is I create a star mask, and these star masks they around a star has a very bright center, and it sort of drops off like a Gaussian curve at the ends. So you can use that to select the stars, 
then you have uh, the inverse of that, which is one minus the brightness of the star mask, which has a slope that goes up uh, outside the stars where you can, can uh, select the, the everything but the stars with. And if you start operating differently on both parts and then start adding the results, then you may have multiplied um, the nebulous part with a higher gain than um, what is tolerable. That, that, that can cause a rim to, to show around on, on the stars when you add them back, back up. Uh, I hope well, most of what they're talking about here is deconvolution. So that's what I was talking about. This is deconvolution. Yeah. So See? there are several ways in which it can happen, but this yeah. is how it happens for me. And uh, yeah. So the star mask that you can use a star mask in, in the, in the de-ringing portion of deconvolution as well, but I generally don't use it. Uh, I have, I make it up uh, ahead of time. Uh, but what I use primarily is I generate a uh, dynamic point spread function. And the way that you do that is you go around and you select stars of certain intensities between 0.3 and 0.8 usually. And you make up a function that is dependent on where you are in the geometry, okay? It's geometrically dependent uh, and, and, it, and it defines a point spread of the star at that, at that point in, in your uh, image. Uh, and so I use that in the deconvolution step for uh, the way to reduce the atmospheric effects and essentially make the star smaller. That's where I get. Hey guys, can I, can I just interrupt for a second? Hey, Tom, did you get my images? Yes, I did. Okay, I'm, let's take that up next week. I'm not even supposed to be here tonight. I, I was going uh, to, and since Jerry left, uh, let's do it next week. It's, it's okay. going to be something we can... Uh, Okay, sorry guys. You can continue. That makes sense. See you later, okay? Thanks, Tim. See you later, okay. Tim. See you later. So, yeah, between deconvolution, the other ringing phenomena, I haven't really seen, but deconvolution for one thing, and that's what those images were showing there, were deconvolution type ringing uh, setups right there. That's a Gibbs effect. You can look it up, you can Google it. Yeah, no, so, this is an interesting uh, subject. You know, it's it, it's one of the biggest problems in, in processing because everybody wants to separate the stars from the background and that interface where the stars... The starless image. It's very difficult to fix that right. And uh, it's crucial yeah. to, getting a, to getting a good image. So it, we, we could spend a whole session maybe on this. I mean, it would be interesting to see from A to Z. I mean, if you want to prepare something sometime in PixInsight, I can try to do something in GIMP and see where we end up and how, how what kind of- I've like had that. really good luck with my, there's some of the stuff, like for example, what I really liked was the image that I did of, um, and it was a crappy, you know, it was, it, was, it was crappy as far as the light pollution, but the one that I did of the Christmas tree cluster, the star masking in that, let me see if I can pull that one up because I just loved it. I mean, it, it's blown up too quite a bit digitally. So when I did it, I was really pretty impressed with it. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Let's see here, Christmas tree cluster. Oh, um, but yeah, you know, it's, there, there's a knack to some of this stuff. Let me see if I can hear you. Christmas crop. No, that's not it. Christmas tree cluster. I don't have it. Anyway, you guys keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find it. I think Mike wanted to uh, present something. I did. So time to switch to a different subject. You're muted, Mike. Oh, okay. No wonder yeah. nobody's there. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was able to, uh, uh, I wanted to, to take that uh, thing where the, you know, Mercury and Venus and yeah. the moon were going to be in series. I don't know if you can see this or not. But, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the one thing that's not really apparent from this was um, this was probably the newest moon I've ever seen. Uh, in the in the telescope, um, mm -hmm. it was just a thin line all, all the way around. It, there, there wasn't any 
that there wasn't any detail in in the moon at all. It was like a couple of hours old or something like that. It was really uh, mm. really really interesting. And That's probably so, about where the moon is going to be at four o'clock in the morning, something that that low, huh? Oh, geez, if that's if that's true, I'm going to have to move my uh, the telescope and all that. But a couple uh, the next day, um, it got a little bit brighter. You can see uh, this is just one day, and this was the, like the Earth shine, so it really was very very uh, thin uh, on there. So I'll stop sharing. Yeah, those, those are great shots, Mike. So, oh, uh, yeah. so I was hoping to take the, some images of Mercury at, at sundown, but it's been pretty windy, and so that means it's all jumbled up. Uh, right now, it's probably going to look like a half moon. Um, on that day, on the first day, I was taking a look at uh, Mercury and Venus, and they were both very tiny dots, uh, very small. And I, I bet now that you could uh, probably uh, see, uh, Mercury is probably a lot larger and might even have uh, detail if the uh, scene is good enough. That's the one I was trying to oh. show. I couldn't pull it up, but I mean, it's digitally cropped way down because the light pollution is terrible. But I really like the way that the stars got masked out. The masking is pretty much right on, spot on on that. So this is a case where I have used that same masking technique and then inverted it again to bring the stars back out. I don't use a starless image like uh, what Hink is talking about, though. So, mm -hmm. but it works for me. It, I, I've pretty much got a technique now that that doesn't have any problems. Uh, uh, you know, there's a few variations you need to make, but. Right. Nice. So, so Dick, how did you learn about this? Trial and error. <laughs> it took me a long, long, long lengthy process because partially because I'm so stupid to begin with, but I just, you know, I, I, I couldn't find a way to do it, nor could I find anyone, you know, including Keller, the book I read on Pixit site. Yeah, I couldn't find anybody to really get me there. And so I just said, okay, let's look at this problem here. I'm not getting the same results. I don't want to do it the same way for small stars that I want to do it for large stars. So how can I simplify this? And so I just thought, well, okay, I'm going to have a small thing. I'm going to have a small bag. I'm going to have a medium-sized bag. And I'm going to have a large bag to put these stars in. And then I'm going to treat each of those bins in the same way, in, ter in terms of convoluting the image, in terms of binarizing it, all of those techniques are applied. I can go through the whole method. That method part won't take too long. The parts that take long time are more where you have to select a lot of points. For example, uh, when I do background neutralization, uh, it, I usually select over a thousand points. So you're gonna be doing that for freaking you know, half an hour or so, 45 minutes before you're done. Uh, so that takes a while. And then running it through photometric color calc can take uh, some time. Uh, you know, it could take up to 30 minutes to do that. Yeah, that's a good book. That's the latest one. I've got the previous version of that book. Uh, but uh, Keller is real good, uh, very simplistic. Uh, I've gone through there and applied his procedures and they work. Uh, I wasn't successful in applying the comet procedures, but I was successful in applying the mosaic procedures that he has in there. And you don't need to read about everything. You can kind of go through and then he kind of gets into more specialized topics like mosaicing and comets and so forth because they have to be treated differently. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be. So, uh, go ahead, Mike. Okay, I'm going to be doing a uh, a project. I've you know I've got all these two inch filters, uh, light pollution filters, and uh, one of the things that I was doing for the club up here is take some constellation pictures, 
And so um, there's a lot of light pollution. So what I discovered with this cheapy 50 millimeter lens is that the two inch filter fits right over the, uh, the lens there. So um, that gave me an idea to, to, to look, oops, you know, at uh, finding some adapters so that I can put over this 50 millimeter lens and my 85 1.4 lens. Are you um, going to test different, you're going to test a bunch of different filters? Yeah, I'm going to test a bunch of different filters and hopefully I'll have something to, to share with people uh, uh, on that. Um, I'm waiting for them to come in. Uh, so I got something coming from Adorama for the 85 millimeter. I've got to go find a 49 to 48 reducer uh, for the other one. And I'll be taking pictures with uh, both of them. So I, I figure I got about five or six different uh, filters, and I'll be, you know, I'll be testing with uh, H alpha, and uh, I've got like four or five, you know old uh, Lumicon type filters that everybody seems to have bought over the years and see how good or bad they are uh, with respect to the uh, LED lighting that's so prevalent around here now. So is what, what makes a difference in price on filters? Is it how narrow the bands are or is there other qualities that change? Yeah, the, yeah. The and multi-bands like the Optolons are multi-band. Uh, they're, they're dual band. Um, other ones, the filters are getting very pricey nowadays. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, OCP selling some tri band or quad band filters that are close to a thousand dollars, five or six hundred dollars for something this size. It's kind of ridiculous. I'm trying to figure out which one I got here. I've got a CLS on this 24 millimeter. I've got the Optolon Pro and the Optolon Enhance. I don't have the Extreme, but I've got, you know, a couple of Ryan visual and photographic light pollution filter. I even have an old Parks light pollution filter. I'll try and use. They're all about, they're all two inches. So, uh, yeah. Oh, but are you going to have to get, are you going to get one this, for the size of the lens that you have or no, are you I'm just going to stick them on top? Well, with the 50, 50 millimeter lens, okay, yeah. the, the filter it, size. Yeah, you're is, pretty close. Yeah. And, 51, 51 and, millimeters. And this is 85 millimeter, I mean, uh, 58 millimeter. So. Uh -huh. I'll just stop them down because you got to stop them down anyway. Oh yeah, just stop it down. Sure. Yeah. And the idea is look at the central part and see, you know, um, if you can see more nebulosity or if they screw up the, the, the colors of the, of the stars. That's something to uh, look into. And I'll, I'll be varying the exposure time because it is easy to overexpose a star and make it look white, you know. I got a hot, it's H A I D A, hot Hada, 77 millimeter clear night filter. That's what I got. Um, I mean, it seems to be okay, but I'm comparing it to nothing. So I, mean, I haven't really done an extensive test. So I would be interested in what you're doing there. Yeah. Um, it seems okay. Um, I, I have taken some, I don't have it here, I can't find them. Um, I have taken some constellation pictures, especially when I was trying to take um, um, Vesta and, uh, and uh, Leo, and yeah, you, you, could, you could see it, but uh, the light pollution was just pretty significant. Pretty bad, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so hopefully it'll help. Um, I'm also thinking about somehow 
um, with a clear filter, the technique where you put a little Vaseline around the outside to soften up the images. Uh, I think that's what um, some- Vignetti? Guys, what? Vignetti? No, no it's selective, selective um, softness to make the lens softer. So oh, okay, so you're it. like doing an iris, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So, yeah, and uh, I, I, you know, there was that one Japanese guy that used to have all those beautiful pictures in uh, Sky and Telescope. I think he used something like that, that technique, so that you, you, you get the light, you know, for the for the color, you know, because you need it to go deeper, but then it blurs it just a little bit so you don't burn out the center. Oh, hmm. yeah. So I heard uh, that. Oh. Yeah, because it's it's awfully easy to 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 burn out the, the star and then you lose the color. And when you're trying to get the bright ones with the, the dark ones, it really is a hmm. major problem. So, so 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 Mike, what what is the Windy Observatory's uh, group been doing? I've been talking about different things. Uh, uh, let's see, what did I do last time? Let me bring it up. Um, I think I did Constellation uh, and talked about little trackers and, and stuff like that. It, it's, it's, the membership's been kind of, kind of sparse. A lot of people are forgetting the to, to, to log on or they go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I guess you guys are going through the, the same thing too. You, you've got the, the, the same core people. But um, one of the things I was going to talk about was, um, and I, I got to think about it for the next meeting, which is coming up real soon, is uh, the likely likelihood of uh, life on planets. What I was doing, I, I, I read an article where they're thinking about redoing the Drake equation. Uh, and because they're, they're thinking that there's some factor that people aren't thinking about. And so, you know, I plugged it in and um, I came up with a number of 250 likely civilizations in our galaxy. Um, and so, uh, I think when you when you think about it, the possibility is going up rather than down, um, because we're learning. You know, back when the Drake equation first started, there hadn't been an exoplanet found. But they were talking about when Carl Sagan was alive, and uh, you know now it seems like uh, they're thinking most stars have planets of one sort or another. So. The, the chances but, are so much. Tom, Tom Whittemore brought up on, I think on our Monday uh, show that Sky and Telescope, I think it was, had a, had a, or maybe some other uh, magazine, had an article on tech, whether a planet would need uh, tectonic uh, plates moving around. Uh, to yeah, I read that. Part of that. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, we're looking in a way, you know, the Earth is, is a really funky, place to be on okay you know because basically we're living on a thin shell over molten lava heated up by uh, uh by disintegration of radioactive uh materials in the core of our planet okay and you know uh the reason why we don't get a hot foot is because rocks is a pretty good insulator you know and so when you think about it we're on a pretty fragile thing and a good portion of the heat from inside is heating up our planet so we don't freeze, okay? Whereas our sun is just bright enough so that, you know, we don't cook. And, you know, uh, when you think about it, the, the sun's a pretty docile place. I mean, sun, I mean, as stars go, you know, uh, you know, people think, well, you know, maybe if we were like, by a, a red dwarf, it would be safer and we could have last longer, but they tend to be unstable sometimes. 
And Very. so you go through this fluctuation of heat, you know. Um, so uh, that's what I was going to go uh, talk about. But you can start plugging the numbers in. And at first, I thought all the numbers were below zero, I mean, below one. But actually, a lot of the numbers are greater than one because part of the numbers is how many planets are there. Well, we know now that a lot of, you know, instead of like none or maybe one or two, quite a few stars have many more planets. And so that just increases the, uh, uh, the, the chances. In, you know, so Mike, uh, Mike, I, su I suggest, have you, do you record your Zoom meetings? Are you recording those on your computer? And then you can post those to YouTube. Uh, no, I, I have to do that. Yeah, <laughs> they, go, they go off into the ether. <laughs> the bit bucket in this sky. Uh, it, it, but, it's really easy to do. Like right now, I'm recording the meeting, and I'll and I'll just upload it to YouTube, a pretty fast uh, 100 megabit per second connection that I'm using. And it, you have a YouTube channel, and uh, it's okay. yeah, it's real really easy to do. I okay. I'll have to think about that. But uh, I'll tell you something. Um, uh, the hard part's coming up with a new subject every month. I mean, it's sort of like um, I spent about two weeks thinking, what do what these guys want to hear about? You know, and, uh, um, I think one of the things I'm going to have them talk about is that one guy is doing a super job of using um, his Dobsonian taking pictures with his iPhone of planets and stuff. Um, he had some really great um, uh, pictures of the double double, you know. Just using a, a capture program and 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 the moon showing a lot of detail in the uh, uh, on on the surface and then another one's got those Z, one of those ZV scopes. It's the totally automatic scope that looks like it has an eyepiece but really is just a, a lens to a, a small screen. And that. Um, what they're doing is they're improving the software significantly and they're getting uh, 10 more images. Uh, you want me to show you the difference of what they're getting? Uh, I can probably bring up my, my email and, and show you. Um, but uh, what they're, 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 they're really working on this scope. It's only like a five inch scope or something like that. And but it's it's totally automated. Um, it, um, well, Celestron had an evolution, next star evolution type scope, and this that one works a lot better. Um, let's see here if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. Let me try and do a share screen. I think the scopes are like three thousand dollars. The one you're talking about. They're not. They're not cheap. Okay, so this is with the previous. Can you see this here? Oh. Yeah. Okay, this is the previous software. So he's having problems with vignetting and surface brightness. This is uh, uh, fifty-one. This is fifty-one. Yeah. Yeah. The new software. Oh wow! Yeah. So they're 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 improving it quite a bit. And then Richard Berry's got one of these also. Luckily, uh, he packed that in the car before his place burned down, and he's starting to do photometry with with this little scope. Mm -hmm. and, uh, people are doing, um, you know, uh, asteroid occultations and stuff like that. that. Just, that's I mean, not a stack. That's just a single exposure, right? No, no. This is. It's a it's sort of like a dynamic staff. Okay, so it's a dot. Okay, it's yeah. it's it's more like like a melon cam or something like that where it builds up, but you don't have access to the raw images to. Right. Yeah, writer. it's just building up the image on its own. Yeah, you don't right. have. The it's got the smarts frame. and stuff. They're, they 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 are thinking about making the raw images available. And one of the downsides side, uh, of this was um, there's no, they didn't 
have a way to put filters on, but I guess people have not figured out a way to do that. So in, the, in case of a place where you have light pollution, put a light pollution filter on if you're careful, but you have to reach down inside and, um, and, and screw it in from below onto the chip inside. It's basically, you know, it's, it's a, it's a prime focus uh, astrograph with a, a tiny CCD chip. But you're so, hooking it up to a regular two inch focusing tube, right? No. Oh. No, on the side, if you take a look at the telescope, um, it will- uh, That's too bad because then you could just use a regular filter. Yeah, I know, but uh, I think they figured a way with probably with one and a quarter inch somehow. Okay, one and a quarter. Adapter. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah there you it. go. Okay, yeah. yeah. Kind of step. So all you're looking through here is just a, it's a screen. Okay. Okay, as it builds up. Builds the image. That's right. so cool. So there's a user group that's uh, um, pretty active and. Uh, um they are working on this uh improving the software the guy the guy told me that the software went from 1.8 um uh gigabytes to four and a half gigabytes so uh, well, that's it, a lot it, more it, to it yeah yeah right a lot more capability uh -huh. so you know can it work for dobsonian do you think i mean can they handle the field rotation or what what do you think I think that they keep the exposures small so they don't have to worry about that. They do a dynamic stack. But I'm just wondering the accumulation of the rotation, field rotation, would that, would the software, I mean, it sounds yeah, like a software yeah. management problem, I think. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So, you know, there's several types. There's that other one from Italy that looks like uh, something out of a science fiction movie, you know. The Stellina, right? Yeah, the Stellina. <laughs> But yeah, that one actually has a field rotator, so that one. Oh be wow! A, yeah, yeah. I've heard bad things about field rotators, though. But you know, they can't; they don't work well. I I don't know if I'm just here in the wrong side of the fence or what, but it's pretty. Yeah, well, with an Altas, it's always difficult. Also, if you have a you know a guide scope and you use a uh, an Altas scope, then essentially the, the field rotates around this, the, the guide star, not around the center of the image, right? So yes. that's a big, big problem there. Mechanically. I, I can't see how you can do it, yeah. Yes. You gotta... so, so the way they do this is they keep the exposure short and they they, they work yeah. against somehow the- uh, And then they just the, stack it, yeah. Right, the only thing they don't have that, that would be really nifty is um, somehow to, well, well, they do, they do do dark, dark frames. Okay, they do tell you to do that, but flat field. Oh, they, flat, they so you can't a, handle the video. They, they don't yeah. have that, and uh, maybe that would improve things just a little bit. But it could be that the way that the optics are, there's probably not that much room there to really drop it off the line. Okay, now here, if you want, let me share. I'll go and try and uh, uh, here, let me not share now and just get in there and I'll show you what my friend did with the uh, with his uh, uh, iPhone. So, right. Okay. Let me do now. Do, okay. Are you seeing it now? Mm hmm. Okay. Okay, so this is with an iPhone when I die. Uh-huh. Neat. Okay, and there's the double double. Uh-huh. So, oh, yeah. so you know the the um let's just say there's more than one way to uh approach a problem of the uh, high resolution photography. Um, and when he was doing that, he was, yeah, you know, because it's real Vista here, he said it was cold and it was windy and it was dark and, uh, you know, things were shaking, but that's pretty doggone good. Uh, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Love look that. at the reels. 
and, and all that. iPhone, guys. iPhone. <laughs> Not this $1,500. Uh, <laughs> Apple does some pretty good stuff. And well, iPhones so, are not cheap. <laughs> no. No, but the, the, the camera is small. You know, this is what you do. You can do with small pixels. And so, anyways, so he he's been doing that. So, uh, um, you know. I'm gonna have to go. Okay, See you well, guys. Before you go, yeah, we've reached a nine o'clock time. I'll share one last screen with you that Jerry had, and this is called "Why Astronomers What What Astronomers Do When They Party," and kind of like tonight's lunar eclipse. Maybe they'll be doing something. <laughs> <like> <laughs> oh, yeah. Moon. Yeah, but it's only half of the moon. Yeah, quarter moon. Yeah. Quarter moon. Crest yeah. <laughs> Cute. I love it. All right, you guys, take care. <laughs> All okay. right. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks for Bye. tuning in. And if you want to share your ideas ahead of time, let me know. Ending, ending the program. Talk later.